Okay, I have long promised medieval weirdness, and today we are finally getting some medieval weirdness. Um, but before I do, a couple things just to share. I mentioned, I think, uh, this chart beforehand, this ridiculousness, in, in section a couple times, and I just wanted to put it here for people who can see this. Like, scientific advancement is apparently a thing you can quantify, I guess. Uh, I don't know what to do with this. Anyway, this is a piece of ridiculousness. It, it shows no semblance to reality. It shows a way particular people think about religion. And I think we want to consider this kind of chart going into uh, next week, where we'll be talking about why we think medieval religion was the way it was. Um, which is to just keep this in the back of your minds. The other thing I wanted to show off was I mentioned that, uh, that customary from Nivelle where they had the lines on it that showed you how big the fish was supposed to be, and this is it. Uh, I didn't realize that they had digitized it, but the, so the, wish, the fish has to be that long and that wide, and for a sense of scale, uh, it's about a 9 or 10 inch piece, long piece of fish. Anyway, that's super fun. So, when we had previously left off, we were talking about a new form of piety, a form of piety which was urban and female, based in the north of France, the Low Countries, and Italy, and prosperous parts of Europe. Uh, popular, which was a popular form of piety, that is to say, among the common people, uh, but really middle class rather than truly poor, and the laity, not for necessarily uh, priests or bishops, which, who used to be the kind of center of piety. It provided, this new piety provided new options for religious practice. Um, and that religious practice was mystical or affective. Affective, as it were. That is, in terms of, you, you showed your piety through devotion rather than simply doing Jesus wizard things. And it's important that from that form of piety, we talked a lot about how women were passive channels for the divine, and that's what the church would be okay with, that there was a necessity of women being mediated by a male cleric, and um, that they not take, that they are subsuming their body to the divine rather than taking the divine and doing something with it. We talked a little bit about Beguines, um, who saw some regulation, right? The the the, the beguinage, the, the collections of women in the south of France, um, with this woman, Mary Duigny. Um, the beguines, as I mentioned at the end of last class, saw some regulation, so they weren't ever considered heretical, but they were also not totally under clerical control, and so they weren't entirely orthodox. So there's a lot of um, concern over the place of Beguines in the Catholic faith. And in this way, the Beguines form what is perhaps the most visible form of the problems with integrating this new interest in popular piety with the structures of the institutional church. But, and I want to be clear here, because this popular slash private dynamic, popular slash, slash elite dynamic is very fraught um, after all who is writing these stories of these begins? Well, we have bishops and cardinals. Jacques de Vitry is a cardinal in the, in the Catholic Church, and he's writing the life of Mary Douagny. So we have to be a little bit careful when we think about these divisions as strict. Right? In any case, this form of piety has very particular expressions, particularly later. They, this form of piety develops particular, say, ruts that the cartwheel travels in. Food is uh, the most obviously important. Uh, Mary Duigny uh, only eats the communion wafer, as we talked about last lecture. As we all talked about in section, Christina the Astonishing eats very little um, when in, that's very little that's not oil she has secreted from her own breasts. This isn't this sort of behavior, this aversion to food or only getting food from mystical sources, has long had an easy interpretation. For most of the 20th century, had a very easy interpretation. 
from the start of modern psychology, this was simply interpreted as uh, anorexia nervosa, that these women were simply, they were, they were wholly anorexics, as, as the book title, as one book title put it. Um, a response uh, kind of manifesting on their bodies an inter internalized misogyny. Um, that was the product of not only a, a culture that despised women, but also um, emphasized the dualism of the body and the soul, right? That the body was in some ways trapped or trapping the soul, as we saw with the Cathars, who thought this very explicitly in terms of the Christians wouldn't quite put it, but the, the idea is similar. And this is a problem because we, it's not necessarily, sorry, before we get to that, um, one, of the, one of the funniest expressions of this kind of way of medieval thinking that people assumed that medieval people thought um, is Oscar Wilde, who said in around 1900, he said, uh, to be truly medieval, one must have no body. To be truly modern, one must have no soul. To be truly Greek, one must have no clothes. In any case, this is this internalized misogyny that people are trying to talk about comes from uh, an area of medical knowledge, um, such as it was, which is called Galenic theory. Uh, Galen was a doctor in uh, late antique Rome, or classical Rome, excuse me, second century, and he had this theory about heat, that. Everything that has to do with humans depends on how much heat they have. And men have the most heat, and women did not quite get enough heat, and therefore are failed men. Because they have insufficient heat, women, they are wet and leaky. <laughs> they menstruate. Um, they are unable to... Um, get into quite the same, you know, they don't have the same energy. They don't have the same vital energy because they are less literally hot. Um, Galen also, this leads to, 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 to some pre-modern, some Roman philosophers advising things like, have sex facing north, because if you face south, then the cold wind will blow into your vagina and your baby will become a girl. Right, so... Uh, in the same way, um, so men, by the way, you have to hold on to your vital heat for the, for the in Galenic theory. Um, that's why you shouldn't get too angry or have sex too often, because sex is, in fact, the act of frothing your blood into semen. That's what semen was thought to be. It was thought to be uh, heated blood, frothed blood, leading to the... Um, the noted scholar Peter Brown's excellent turn of phrase uh, referring to the male genitalia as the outlets of the human espresso machine. In any case, post-Gregorian, that is to say after the Gregorian reforms, clerical masculinity does see chaste men, men who do not let out any of their vital heat through any means sexual or not, as the highest tier of masculinity. Um, and women are naturally a corruptive influence on that. Women are trying to steal your heat. <laughs> I, 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 this is a little weird to talk about. I just, that's the way it was. Um, and it's, again, easy to see women fasting, women not taking things into their body, not letting things go out of their body, as a facet of this view of gender. And, or even more simply, they just, you know, hated themselves because they were being told that they were incomplete people. Um, but circa about 1990, uh, a scholar called Catherine Bynum, uh, Carolyn, sorry, excuse me, Carolyn Walker Bynum offered a different perspective. And um, I think she has the right perspective, but I just kind of want to signal something here that Bynum is uh, considered by the people who talk about uh, new medievalism as like the new medievalist uh, par excellence, is that, sh that, that usually those rants about new medievalists are specifically and deliberately talking Carolyn Walker, uh, Ca uh, Carolyn Walker Bynum, um, which is just an interesting thing to keep in the back of your mind. We'll talk about more of that later. In any way, case, Bynum says that no, 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 this is not anorexia nervosa. This is not internalized misogyny. Food 
Controlling your food as a medieval woman was a way of claiming authority and manipulating social roles. That is to say, fasting, fasting on uh, worldly food prepares an individual for eating the holy. And holy eating makes the individual one with the divine, providing that individual with social and moral authority. Well, how much authority, really? We've seen uh, uh, Christina the Astonishing ordering nuns about, uh, but that's not a lot of authority, and it's only the beginning. So this woman, um, Catherine of Siena, was born in 1347, the year before the Black Death hit Europe, to uh, a cloth dyer. So once again, people in the clothing industry, very important for this kind of sanctity, mostly because they had, that's kind of the profession that had the, the right amount of money, I think. Uh, Christina was the 22nd out of 25 children that her mother, uh, Lapa, had. Um, half of her brothers and sisters at some point died in childbirth. So that tells you something, or died um, in, in, uh, before they were adults, which tells you something about survivability and life expectancy in this period. Anyway, so she's 22nd out of 25. Her mother was essentially pregnant. Let's see, she was from the age of uh, 17 until she was 43, 44. Uh, that's insane. In any case, Christina began to see visions of Christ from an early age. Um, and she also had experience with food as a means of social negotiation from an early age. Catherine's sister had, quote unquote, reformed her husband, her abusive husband, by refusing to eat until he behaved better. Her sister also died at childbirth in childbirth at the age of 16, by the way. Um, and her parents, Catherine's parents, wanted to marry Catherine to the same man after the death, to keep the, the relationship in the family. Um, Catherine does, does not approve of this for <laughs> numerous reasons, um, one of which, you know, childbirth, she's had a pretty visceral experience with her sister dying as to what the effects marriage can have on one's life expectancy. Uh, second, the guy was freaking abusive, right? He doesn't, she doesn't want any part of this relationship, whether or not he's reformed through fasting or not. And we can actually know some of this because unusually, unlike the other women we've been talking about who, for whom we only have um, clerical sources writing about them, we actually have uh, a lot of Catherine's old writing, own hand, own, own writing, the stuff that she, she herself wrote about herself. Um, of course, we have to be a little bit cautious about that because that stuff was then collected and copied by men. But in at least theory, this is in some way, shape, or form her own words. In any case, uh, so Catherine does not want to get married, lives outside a Dominican nunnery, which is, remember, women by this period are strictly enclosed, even those affiliated with mendicant orders, where these orders are supposed to be going out into the world. Um, and this is uh, quite common to live just kind of outside or next to the wall of a uh, religious house. Uh, the practice of anchoritism, which is when women would enclose themselves within a small cell of which they cannot exit, usually, uh, in, usually in the wall of a church, um, is very popular from the 12th century. And if you want to know more about that, I highly suggest you take Professor Remen Snyder's class, Locked Up, The History of the Prison, which is excellent. In any case, so while living outside of this uh, Dominican uh, convent, in 1368, so she is 21, Christina claims that she is has been granted a mystical marriage to Christ. She's married Christ in a mystical form. And this, of course, comes from the Song of Songs, the two interpretations of the Song of Songs, which talks about, uh, which we have mentioned from time to time, which talks about 
which is in fact a love pro poem of a bride longing for her husband um, and is interpreted in the church by the church in the uh, second millennium as being the church longing for Christ the bridegroom. And so in this case, Catherine just kind of takes it a step further and makes it explicit uh, as, a, as a marriage. She even goes one step further than that and says that she has been given a wedding ring. And that wedding ring is not gold, nor jewels, uh, nor anything uh, precious metals, but is in fact the foreskin of Christ. <sighs> um, aside on the foreskin of Christ. Um, of course, there can be no physical relics of Christ on earth because Christ ascended into heaven. His whole body went up into heaven. So you cannot have the usual cult of saints around regular objects. And so instead you have things like the wood of the cross, the nails of the cross, and then the little bits and pieces, uh, the Shroud of Turin, for example, actually, which is the shroud that supposedly wrapped Christ's head and therefore has the imprint of his face on it. Um, and then bits and pieces of him that wouldn't have gone up to heaven. Um, this includes his fingernail clippings, uh, his baby teeth, his blood, and his foreskin, which as a good Jewish child would have been removed on the eighth day following his birth, as we see in a Renaissance painting here. And he doesn't really look like he wants that to happen. In any case, We'll get back to that picture in a second. We're still shutting up about the Song of Songs. Um, it's in the foreskin of Christ, uh, whether or not it's actually on Catherine's finger, uh, is an acknowledged relic in through the 16th century. There's a couple different one people claiming to be the, the pupus of Christ, the foreskin of Christ. Um, there's an apocryph apocryphal story that the papal astronomer's response to Galileo's discovery of the rings around Saturn was that this was in fact not rings around a planet, but the foreskin of Christ stuck on its own ascent up into heaven. Um, again, the foreskin is a subject of multiple theological controversies uh, up until the 19th century, um, when there was at least one pope placed a ban of interdict on the subject, which means you can't talk about it um, without uh, being censured by the church doesn't matter. Anyway, Catherine married to Christ with the foreskin as a wedding ring. And this is this is just gold. Um, much much more practical, I find. Catherine's sanctity, whether or not because of these claims or because of the way she lived or whatever, Catherine's sanctity is widely acknowledged very quickly, and she uses this acknowledged sanctity to great effect. She convinces the town of Lucca, which is on the uh, Italian coast, pretty, it's like three hours drive from Siena, it's a little bit far, but he, she convinces, goes to the town of Lucca and convinces the town not to side with the Ghibellines, that is to say, not to side with the Holy Roman Empire against the papacy. She also, at this point in time, after doing this kind of political act, receives the stigmata, um, which you can see on her hand, the sort of dot on her hand there. The stigmata are the wounds of Christ, the nail wounds through the, through the hands and a spear wound in the side. And we'll talk about that spear wound in a second. Catherine also convinces Gregory the Ninth to return to Rome in 1376 from Avignon. You remember the papacy for most of the 14th century had relocated to Avignon um, and Catherine is mostly, we mostly agree on this, Catherine is probably the one who who's, who's in, went to the Pope in Avignon and said, please come back. And he did. And she died in 1380 at the age of 33 years. And I wanna talk a little bit so Catherine's life, very interesting, uh, wields immense political power as a woman, as a holy woman, um, at all levels of the church and lay society, right? The, the town of Lucca and the Pope, um, both kind of sides of that secular sacred coin. Um, but I also wanna talk about these stigmata. I wanna talk about these wounds because 
And this is a very important aspect of late medieval piety. Because the, um, the first person to actually acquire the stigmata in, in, the, in the later medieval period, the first person to claim to have been stigmatized, um, is St. Francis of Assisi, who we talked about a little bit last time. But this sort of claim becomes pretty common over time, as far as saints were common occurrences, which they were not. And this is a part and parcel of the later medieval emphasis on the extreme suffering of Christ on the cross, on the extreme suffering as of Christ the human on the cross. And here you can see, you know, this depiction of Catherine behind me. She's very pale. She has the stigmata on her hand. She looks not comforted. There's the cross kind of behind her in the corner. And she's wearing the crown of thorns, which are not causing her to bleed for some reason. Um, and in this, we have various new ways of, celebra of celebrating the humanity of Christ, particularly this, which is the crucifix, um, which is different. The crucifix does not simply mean a cross. The crucifix means a cross with, a, with the body, with the tortured body of Christ on it. Because also, obviously, crucio is the Latin for verb that means I torture. Right, so, so uh, by the way, uh, Harry Potter, not very original, Crucio, Cruciatus curse, the, the, the torturing curse, yes, that's what it means. Um, that, that's why it's called the thing. So the crucifix, as you see an example behind me here of a bloodied, whipped, entirely, you know, suffering Christ. This is a Mel Gibson movie in a, in a still frame. Becomes incredibly, incredibly important, as do the wounds, specifically the wounds he receives on the cross. So not necessarily the, the whip marks here, but the nail wounds through his hands and his feet and the wound in his side become incredibly, incredibly important as devotional pieces, as things to meditate on. Um, so for example, you see here is a, is a, a depiction of the suffering of Christ where he's getting small men and here size in medieval art is the point is important dependent on the importance of the person, not, there's not children, these are adults who are nailing the very important Christ. Um, in his hands, a spear going through his side and the sponge with vinegar being offered up to him as a sucker and someone placing the crown of thorns on his head. These are the holy wounds, the, 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 the hands, five holy wounds, uh, and there is in later medieval piety, there is something called the Feast of the Holy Wounds, which is a feast day where they commemorate uh, the the they march around with a with a big um, like a paper mache diorama of probably just the hands and his feet with the wounds and then um, a side wound, uh, just kind of an abstract kind of art form of side wound, which we will get to in a second. Um, these are called the Arma Christi, the, 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 the weapons of Christ, literally. Um, and there's a particular emphasis on the side wound as a site of devotion, right? The side wound takes up center frame in this image itself. Because it's a, there, there's blood usually depicted either in this case, but always with blood coming out of it. Um, and of course, Christ's blood, being one of the few things left on earth to make a relic out of, has an um, incredible devotional value. Uh, but there's another side to this, which is that you have a slit which bleeds, and therefore you have a vagina. Yes, yes. These are images of the Arma Christi, of the side wound of Christ. And here you can see that there's not, this is not particularly subtle, right? The, the equivalents, the drawing between this and uh, a vagina are, it's, it's, it's not quite Georgia O'Keeffe, um, but it's halfway there. And this, the, the, the side wound of Christ, this, this, this vaginal opening in Christ's side is eroticized, even in the period. Um, on the left here, you see, there's two different images, almost contemporary, actually. But on the left here, you see a manuscript, which shows on top the crucifixion, 
Um, on the bottom, the two patrons who commissioned it, it looks like praying, it looks like a bishop and a monk. Um, and in the middle is the side wound of Christ, and you can see how it's faded, and that is because someone was looking at this image and gently stroking the center until it wore, no, wore away. All right, someone was physically touching it. Uh, Caravaggio makes this eroticization much more clear in the picture on the right, where he has Doubting Thomas inserting his finger into the side wound of Christ. Um, Catherine of Siena herself, uh, sorry for the quality of this picture, I took it in a basement, uh, it's in the, the catacombs of the church cathedral at Siena, um, is here having a bit of fun with Christ's side wound. I don't know why they put this picture out there in public. Um, unless the Italians have another kind of, Italian Catholics have another kind of relationship to this thing still. But she is kissing the side wound of Christ here. Um, and this is not me just being a, a you know, a graduate student can't help querying things, modern kind of academic interpretation, because I have shown you this picture before. Remember, for the piece of the Holy Wound, they carried around a paper mache of the Holy Wound. And here you have a pewter, pilgrim's badge, which shows four, three, but probably a fourth on the other side, penises carrying around the holy vagina. And this is from the 14th century, I promise you. Right? And not only is it mocked, right, in this sort of side wound, not only are they having a little bit of fun with their religion, because it's, it's you know, eh, it's a vagina. Eh. There's also making it literally. You have images of people usually a woman, because therefore the church, being birthed from the side wound of Christ, just as Eve was taken from the side of Adam. And so, with all seriousness, by the late 14th century, we have a very, very non-binary Jesus going on here. A, in some people's, some people would say a feminized Christ, that's a little bit of an interesting choice of language, which I think reveals more about the people who say it than what's going on. But with this kind of feminized Christ, we see the transition from woman as failed man, which is the Galenic theory, to woman as quasi-divine intercessor. I mean, this is important because the woman as failed man kind of model has no options for spiritual growth, right? Uh, an early medieval saint either is a saint or is not. There's no kind of worry about it, right? And that doesn't feel very uh, accessible for a lot of people, I would think. It doesn't feel accessible to me. And the path towards seeing women or feminized figures, if we want to call this that, and by the way, these are both Christ. It's Christ on the left and Christ on the right, and Christ is pulling Christ, the church out of Christ's side. Just Christ the God, Christ the man, right. Um, we, we, saw, we see this well prepared by the cult that developed from the 12th century around the Virgin Mary. Um, devotion to the Virgin Mary really, really starts going with the Cistercians and Bernard of Clairvaux, which I've mentioned before. Uh, by the 13th century, Mary stands at the center of a lot of Christian devotion. Uh, this is when we start seeing things like discussions about Mary's Immaculate Conception, which actually has nothing, you think, Immaculate Conception, she conceived uh, Jesus as a virgin. No, 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 no one has ever debated that, at least on the Catholic side of things. Uh, the Immaculate Conception is whether Mary was born without sin? Does Mary have original sin? That's a theological question that starts being talked about in the late 12th and into the 13th century. Um, as with Christ, Mary ascends into heaven. The ascension, uh, the ascension occurs, what is it? It's, it's in August of some time. I think it's in August. Anyway, someone else knows better. So, as with Christ, only certain bits of her could possibly remain, including her breast milk. Blood, breast milk, um, baby teeth, no foreskin in this case, umbilical cord. I don't know if those last two are actually ever claimed. Um, and so, in this way, 
this metaphor here, right? Bernard of Clairvaux kneeling and getting breast milk squir squirted from Mary into his mouth, right? Is a very kind of clear metaphor for Mary as someone who can channel divine, the divine through herself and into a clerical authority. Uh, much in the same way that you might interpret Christina's miraculous lactation or lactation of oil, right? That doesn't come from somewhere. It is divine power. She's being possessed by divinity. This is also a period of time where we start seeing women on the Marian model as merciful intercessors, right? As someone you pray to for the remittance of your penalty. What did the penalty do to you? Um, queenship, of course, uh, in the Middle Ages, is long associated with the power of pardon. Usually the king hands out a punishment, the queen ameliorates it, gives you a pardon. Um, and Mary fits quite nicely into this role as kind of a mediator between man and God. Um, so the ultimate saint, as it were. <sighs> By the end of the, and we know that this is like a possession, right? We can say that this is a, this goes from being like channel, from being able to take divine power and use it like a Jesus wizard to simply channeling divine power because by the end of the 14th century, it reaches an ultimate and quite heretical form where the women, certain women claiming to be the literal Godhead, like God has put himself into me entirely. Everything I do is God's actions. And that, that only gets them set on fire. But as previously mentioned, although women are the most visible examples of this later medieval piety, um, plenty of men will follow the model as well. And so we have, for example, Peter of Luxembourg, who you can see here has quite clearly been reincarnated as uh, Matthew van der Poel, who is one of the best uh, pro cyclists in the world. Um, anyway, Peter of Luxembourg, um, who was born in 1369, so roughly contemporaneous with um, uh, Catherine of Siena. And in 1384, he is made bishop of the German town of Metz and a cardinal. And for those of you who are quick at math, you realize that he was made a bishop and cardinal at 14 years old. You can't even be officially ordained as a priest until you're 35, which is also where we get the, the, the age you can become a senator, by the way. Um, or it actually might be senator, might be Roman senator to priest to Roman senator, or to American senator. I'm not sure about that. In any case, I'm pretty sure they're all 35. Um, after that, he can't be a priest until he's 35, but at 14, he's already a cardinal. Um, after being made cardinal, he's kind of kicked out of town by riots, and he gathers some troops and tries to invade it, like, you know, any other secular prince would when kicked out of their town. He's not even a legitimate cardinal. At this point, we have this papal schism I talked. Remember, there are two and then three and then four popes kicking around. Um, he is, Peter here, is made cardinal by the anti-pope who is living in Avignon, right? The papal claimant who did not succeed, who is living in Avignon, Clement VII. Anti-pope Clement VII. There would later be an actual Clement VII, and that's just another form of confusing, but whatever. And Peter is part of the court, the, the anti-pope's court in Avignon. He spends the last three years of his life from 1384, when he's appointed cardinal, to, uh, what, 1387, when he dies, at the age of 17, in the court in Avignon. But despite kind of this, this story, he does spend all of his time, as you can kind of see in this depiction behind me, in fasting and prayer and making sure he lives and is visually depicted in the vocabulary of the apost of apostolic poverty, barefooted, aesthetic, ascetic. Here you can see he is thin, right, in his neck and his chin. It right? is not not quite not chubby. And after the schism resolves, after all those popes collapse back into, the, the papal wave form collapses back into one, uh, and resol is resolved, in 1432, he is made the patron saint of Avignon. Uh, the city of Avignon appoints him to be their saint, 
um, and he is beatified. That is to say, he is made a formal, acknowledged to be a saint by the Catholic Church in 1527, within, you know, 150 years of his death, which is actually quite rapid as these things go. So, even someone who on paper represents the worst of the papal curia's corruption and the excesses of the church, you know, being appointed a cardinal at the age of 14, this is nothing to do with any sort of rules and regulations that are going on. This is all secular power and money. Even someone who, you know, isn't even affiliated with the right pope, or the pope that wins, does not the papal line that wins, is not the papal line that makes him a saint. But this affective piety, as depicted in him, was so great that they would still be interested in making him a saint. But even as this new model of piety allowed middle class, at least the, the middle, the, this new kind of growing middle class, aspirational access to sanctity and women to a new, if very specific and limited role in the church, um, digesting religious populism proves very difficult for the institutional church. There are, despite kind of including these women, these groups, this new form of uh, piety, this popular form of piety, um, there are new heretical groups and conflicts that arise, you know, like we had the, um, the Cathars and the Valdensians before. Uh, the Lollards, for example, I'm sorry, I mentioned, you know, a couple of women went a little bit too far. They usually did not have, and claimed to be fully divine, they usually did not have a, a large following around them. That usually did not turn into, in fact, it never turned into a, a, a major political force. Um, but, for example, we have the Lollards, which is probably from the old Dutch word lollen, which means to mumble. They would mumble prayers to themselves, which is, a, which is based on... Um, the kind of the thoughts and teachings of this guy, John Wycliffe, who is an Oxford theologian, uh, who is dismissed from Oxford for his theological ideas. He also translated the Bible into English for the first time in 1381. Wycliffe insisted that scripture alone is the only possible source for church Doctrine. There is no source or legitimacy to any doctrine that does not have a foundation in Scripture. The Latin for Scripture alone is sola scriptura, and you should remember that phrase because it will come up next week. He also has differences over Eucharistic theology, that is, like how much of Christ is really in the bread. Um, don't want to get into details that details of that, but you know it's there. And the, 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 the Lollards, the people who also kind of wanted the, uh, this English Bible and things like that, and th thought that Wycliffe was right about uh, the way the communion worked, were persecuted quite terribly for the next 150 years, but were eventually kind of wrapped into English Protestantism after Henry VIII wanted a divorce in the 16th century. And we'll again get into that more next week. There's also, in the same vein as Wycliffe, uh, this guy, Jan Hus. Um, as you can see, they're clearly taking beard styling tips from each other. Uh, we've talked about, I've talked about Hus before and the Husites, um, but John, Jan Hus was another academic in Prague, uh, in this case, in the University of Prague, and he was deeply influenced by Wycliffe's thought. He calls, as a preacher on the, on, the, on the pulpit of the cathedral, he called for the reform of the priesthood, reform of the papacy, um, from modern excesses like those represented by someone like Peter of Luxembourg, someone who was being appointed cardinals at 14 because their parents had money. Also, um, again, I mentioned this before, communion of both kinds. You can look at previous lectures if you want to think, uh, remember what that is. It's not super important. Um, but he was also really, really, really opposed to indulgences, which I also mentioned, which are those things that say, since you have given the money money to the church, we now remit from you uh, 40,000 years of suffering in uh, purgatory. And 40,000 years is actually quite a typical uh, kind of guarantee in these documents. <laughs> 
in any case. The local archbishop is actually quite fine with Hus's kind of calls to reform, might even agree with them, uh, but he dies, and Pope Innocent VII orders Hus's suppression in 1405. Um, this essentially leads to a popular uprising in what uh, Bohemia, what is now the Czech, uh, Czech Republic, Czechia, Czechia. Um, as I have already covered, uh, Hus is tricked, tried, and burned at the stake in um, 1415, as you can see in this image behind me, as a heretic. Um, this kicks off something called the Hussite Wars, against which a crusade is actually called by the papacy in 1420. Um, and although this goes back and forth for a while, a lot of the demands of the Hussites are eventually kind of acknowledged, communion of both kinds, as I said in the previous lectures. Finally, we have people like this guy. This is a very distinct figure. This man is Savonarola, um, who is a Dominican preacher in Florence and who died in 1498, right at the cusp of modernity, as it were. He has a very, um, for reasons we'll get into in a second, images of Savonarola have been, were at the time banned. And so you will often find um, other Dominican saints with this particular um, profile, in particular uh, St. Peter Martyr, uh, will we'll often have this sort of nose and lips to him because they have simply put Savonarola's face onto a different saint so they can continue to venerate him. But Savonarola, much like Jan Hus, preached against the excesses of the Renaissance church um, and being in Florence, particularly the Medici family, but also uh, Rodrigo Borgia, who is Pope Alexander VI, who is one of the more worldly popes that is out there. Um, is, I think The Borgias with uh, Jeremy Irons is on Netflix. Um, it's ridiculous, but it's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. Uh, it is, it's, it's, a stupid, it, it's stupid good. Um, not it's stupidly good, it's just stupid and good. In any case, uh, following a French invasion of Italy, um, which happens from time to time, Savonarola basically runs Florence. Um, he runs it as a theocratic state with uh, what are essentially clerical brown shirts going around beating anyone up um, who happens to have their dress cut too low or happens to have a um, cod piece that's quite a little bit too large or ornate or their their shoes um, go up too far, right? The, those pointy shoes, the ones that turn like that, that's, that's to do with your dick size, by the way. That's why those are there. It's saying I have a big, that, that, that's, that's medieval fashion for you. Um, and culminates in something called the Bonfire of the Vanities, in which um, a lot of um, Renaissance artists are compelled or think they should burn their own work. Uh, Savonarola also is a particular opponent of what he calls sodomy, um, which technically means um, any sort of sex that doesn't uh, involve procreation, but in this case probably does mean um, uh, homosexual uh, sex. Um, which was apparently quite a thing in Florence. There's a whole book on that. It's quite good. Anyway, um, but eventually, uh, Savonarola goes too far and is uh, excommunicated by uh, Rodrigo Borgia. Not because of anything he said, because everyone's saying horrible things about Rodrigo Borgia, um, but in fact because he refused to uh, have Florence support the Pope against France, um, for purely political reasons then. Uh, he's excommunicated, Savonarola is excommunicated, fails to show up to a trial by fire, um, and the town immediately turns on him after this as a, as a false prophet. Um, he is uh, hanged, and then his body is burned, as so there may, will be no relics of him, and then his face, his likeness is banned in Florence. You're no longer allowed to make it, and then the Dominicans do the thing where they paint other saints with the, his face. And so we come now to the edge of the Protestant Reformation. At this point, we see that there's a popular appetite for accessible religion, which is only at best partially under control. It's a little bit more wild, I think, than a lot of people would think. You know, there's side wounds and, 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 and foreskins kicking around places, whatever. 
Um, th but this piety is also affective, right? It has to do with prayer and self, kind of self-denial, self, -denial, self uh, meditation on human suffering takes, and embodying human suffering takes kind of center stage. And there's also a great deal of criticism about the excesses of the institutional church. And this these forms of criticism and this form of piety dictate not only the form in which the Protestant Reformation will manifest, but also lay the groundwork for how we think about medieval religion today. And that will be the subject for next week. Um, one final note before I go. Yes, 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 I'm almost done grading things. Um, they will certainly be out by Wednesday. Uh, everyone shall have their, their projects fully graded by Wednesday, I promise. Um, don't forget to schedule a time to meet with me in section or otherwise, um, or sorry, sorry, in office hours or otherwise to go over your projects before that due date hits. Um, other than that, see you guys on Friday.